Would you join me in prayer here as we jump in the word? Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for all that you're doing in the midst of us today. And Holy Spirit of God, I am asking that you would anoint your word, that it would clarify, that it would dust off foundations, that it would assign responsibility, that we would recognize the gift and the calling that rests upon each of our lives individually, as well as the corporate calling to reconcile the world back unto the Lord, to set apart humanity, to set apart the earth as the place that God dwells amongst men, as the place where God is dwelling among men and that God's footstool and his rule and reign would be upon the earth in and through humanity. God, I thank you for these things. And I bless, I bless, I bless our time. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would give me utterance. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We pray these things right now in Jesus' name. And if you agree to that, you said, amen. amen. Uh, I want to remind you, for the last several weeks, we have begun to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, about the gate of life. If you remember, every time the gate of heaven opens up, we've got wind and fire manifesting. We've got this reality of the uncreated God peering into time, into the earth realm, and each time there is a supernatural experience that begins to take place. We see that on the day where Adam and Eve sinned, that the door to heaven was closed the cherubim and the flaming sword of fire placed in the way, that the way to life eternal is closed to humanity as Adam and Eve are pushed out of the garden to begin to live their life from separated from that reality of life eternal. We see at different points in God's interaction with people where he will communicate to them and he sets his covenant before them and he says to them if you'll walk in my ways then life eternal life is available to you we see that interaction through the old testament the old covenant different individuals walking in that eventually to be fulfilled in the person of jesus where jesus prepares the way makes the sacrifice with his own blood cuts a new covenant where the sins of humanity would be covered and washed, that the door of heaven and eternal life might be reopened to humanity. On the day of Pentecost, after Jesus has ascended, the new covenant has been presented to the apostles. Forty days, Jesus is presenting these things to them. And then on the day of Pentecost, a violent, mighty, rushing wind comes blowing into the upper room of the temple where they have gathered. Tongues of fire come and rest on each one, the wind and fire. The door has been opened. The life of heaven begins to fill these individuals. Everyone there experiences this flow of life. The scripture says that thousands of people that are gathered in the city at the time come running to the temple area. What in the world's going on? Peter shares with them, this is who Jesus was. This is what has happened. And now you have available to you as well to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. All you need to do is be baptized into Jesus' name. Everyone repeat after me. Baptized into Jesus. Last week we began to discuss how you and I have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the temple was a place of great blessing. God's presence dwelt there. And specifically, God had assigned his name to the temple. So that when anybody would pray towards Jerusalem, anyone would pray towards the temple, the promise was that God, because his name was assigned to that place, that God's eye would be fixed on that, whoever prayed towards Jerusalem, whoever would pray 
towards the temple because God's name was assigned in that place. That they would be healed. Let me list, list it off. Ready? They would be forgiven. That's a good deal. Anybody like forgiveness? We got nothing but perfect people here. You don't need forgiveness. They would receive justice. If you've ever had injustice in your life, you know that's a terrible deal. But when people would pray towards that place, God would grant them justice. That's amazing. What a promise. They would become victorious. Victory. You win. I win. All we got to do is set our hearts towards where God had assigned his name. They'll be provided for. Divine provision. You got money troubles? Awesome. You should start praying. That if you would pray towards Jerusalem, this was the promise, the old covenant under the old temple system that God would provide for the nation of Israel as long as they would humble their hearts, recognize God's ways, and pray. And then the Lord would restore, reconcile, and release provision in the land. That was the promise. If there was disease or a plague, it would be removed. That's pretty good. I'm not sure I've ever had a plague before, but disease would be removed. That's pretty powerful. They would be divinely healed. Okay, look at your neighbor and say, that's a pretty good deal right there. I'm glad that we're going to get healed. They'd be delivered. So if there was torment, deliverance would take place. People and nations would come to the Lord. Why? Because people were praying. What was lost would be restored, reconciled, restoration. If there was an inheritance that had been lost, the inheritance would be reconciled back to the people that lost it, and they would receive what they were meant to walk in. These are awesome promises. All of this had to do with God's people having their hearts bent towards where God had assigned his name, the temple, the place of covenant. Last week, we talked about how the place of God's covenant has no longer in a building. That in 70 AD, when the Romans came into Jerusalem, they utterly destroyed the temple and they performed a ritual sacrifice with a pig on the holy altar. And the reason why Romans would do that was to clear the name of a previous God on that temple structure. That was why they did it. And so in 70 AD, Rome comes in, destroys the temple where God had assigned his name. They perform a ritual sacrifice in order to erase the name of God from that place. The covenant that was, that that was the place of God's covenant, we know that in Christ, that when the Holy Spirit comes, one of the main things he was going to do was write the covenant on our, our hearts. We're told that we've become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But one of the main attributes of becoming a temple, how do you become a temple? God's name must be written upon that place. How does someone get God's name written over their life? You must be baptized into Christ Jesus. When you are baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, your life, your vessel becomes a holy, sanctified, set-apart temple. That the Holy Spirit would dwell there. That God's name would be assigned to your life. That you would have the seal of his presence and his promised inheritance on your body, on your life. And all these promises that were for the temple suddenly become yours. That's a good deal. Tell your face. It's a good deal. <laughs> and you and I, every week we come together, we reiterate the covenant. I think because we forget. I think because the world 
is so inundated with sin and debauchery that we become defiled. And we're needing to remember, we're needing to proclaim, we're needing to, to declare this covenant because this precious promise is given to those who believe. How do you overcome the world? You believe. There's got to be more than that, Pastor Jamie. No. How do you overcome? Do you want to know how you overcome this sin that's been destroying your life for years and years and years? you want to know how you overcome it? You believe that Jesus has already been victorious. That's it. You enter into his victory. You enter into his victory. There's no other way. If you try to do it yourself, you will fail. You'll keep failing. There's no promise in your victory. There's only a promise in Jesus's. If you want to overcome, believe the blood. Believe the blood. How do you overcome the devil? The blood. This covenant is your victory. Are you alive today? Now, I am preaching the gospel to those already saved. God bless you. Today, we're going to take a step forward. I want to invite you into a reality that has to be built on the foundations of what we've already laid. Because, frankly, if you haven't laid these previous foundations, this other thing that we're going to talk about today is misunderstood. Okay? This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. If you've got a Bible, open up there. You guys ready? I'm not sure you are. You ready? Come on, let's do it. 1 Peter 2, verse 4. If we got it, we could put it up there. Maybe? Nope. Okay, let me read it for you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Coming to him, coming to Jesus, as to a living stone which was rejected by men, but is the choice and precious stone in the sight of God. You also... As living stones, everyone say living stones. You are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in the scriptures previously. Behold, I'm laying of in Zion a choice stone a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. You know, you believe in Jesus, that's why you can cheer the things I'm saying this morning. I mean, frankly, if depending on the background that you grew up in and church-wise, maybe some of the things I'm saying this morning are offensive to you. Jesus is offensive to the religious mind. Jesus is offensive to the world. We're saying you cannot have connectedness with the Father unless you have Jesus in place. There is no other way to the Father. There are plenty of worship systems out there. There are plenty of pathways that will achieve, you know, these worldly versions of peace. But there is no connection to the uncreated God except through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race. Everyone say a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Okay? You are a people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy but now you have received mercy. You are a holy priesthood. Come on, repeat after me again. Priesthood. You're a priest, 
A priest under your God. You are a priest. Priests are assigned to the worship in a temple system. You and I are living stones. Jesus being the chief cornerstone. Jesus being the foundation of what's being built. You and I are living stones being fashioned together as a community into a temple that God dwells within here on earth. You are priests. Priests who are called to minister to the temple and on behalf of the temple. You are priests who are called to stand in between the uncreated God and a creation that has been defiled, that has been touched by sin and brokenness, that is not holy. And you and I are called to be ministers of reconciliation that we might stand between the uncreated God in formation of a holy dwelling place of God as priests who minister to a world that has no access. You're a priest. Go home and tell your, your Catholic father. <laughs> so you know. Okay, life isn't easy, is it? It's not easy, and you and I both have been raised in environments, not in our houses, not in with our parents. I mean in the world. This world does not live in accordance with the ways of the kingdom. The world economy is not based on the kingdom economy. There are so many things. You have had to learn to adapt in a dog-eat-dog -dog world in order to make means for your family and survival but then you're also being asked to be a priest that represents a completely different way of life. And your job, Jesus said, is to disciple the nations so that they will walk and live according to heaven's ways. But inside of us often is this inner battle. This is what I'm going to camp out on today. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this point right now, that you're a priest that you are called to bring reconciliation to the world, but that you yourself struggle sometimes. And what do you do with that? We're going to spend the rest of our time in the book of James, in two chapters. This is James chapter 4 and James chapter 5. We're going to just walk through it in simplistic form, and you're going to see as James, the brother of Jesus, is addressing the mindset of worldly people who have become Christians. And they're clearly confused as to how they're supposed to behave in Christ because they were raised with a value system that's opposite. And, and maybe there'll be one or two things in here that you still struggle with, but probably only one or two, okay? Like you're, you're well on your way. Preaching to the choir this morning. You don't even need me up here. You could definitely preach this one. Verse 1, chapter 4. You ready? Okay, you guys got this. It's, it really is going to be okay. Just want to remind you that before we start. <laughs> What's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Why do you fight with other believers? Is not the source your pleasures that are waging war in your members? What that means is this, is that you want something and you want something and the members of the body, we're at war with one another. Why? Because we want different things. The pleasure, pleasure is I want. I want, I want, I want. Okay? You want something, but there's a war going on because you know that you ought not, but you want it. Okay? It's pleasurable. It's a desire. Okay? The second part there. You lust. Okay, lust means an appetite, not sexual lust. It doesn't need to be sexual lust. It is, I have a, an appetite for this thing that I am not turning off. I want that thing, and there's an appetite for it. You lust, but you don't get it. You don't get what you're lusting after. And so you commit murder. Now, it's been a while since we've had someone kill another church member.
It's a crazy church members meeting. It was, you know, it's like, yeah, something about Hamilton and Burr. I don't know. It was crazy. What's the source of your quarrels and conflicts? Your pleasures are at war. You're lusting and you don't have, so you commit murder. Okay, you're willing to do anything to get what you want, and so you're hurting each other. You're envious, and you can't obtain it. And so you fight and you quarrel. But James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and don't receive because you're asking with the wrong motive. So that you can spend it on your own pleasures. This is the behavior of an adulteress, this says. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So again, I want you to think culturally. I want you to think of these two world systems. It's the world system and God's system. Two kingdoms. They're at odds with one another. You can't actually get both. I wish you could. You can't, okay? You can't become your B billionaire and step on people and kill people to get your money and at the same time proclaim that you're a Christian businessman. You can't do it. You can't destroy one life over here in order to get what you want and then go plead the blood of Jesus over here and pretend like everything's okay. The calling is to have a congruent life. Why? Because you are a holy priesthood. You represent the king and his kingdom, and you're called to reconcile the world who's in brokenness, and that behavior is happening, to a holy God. But you're praying, and it's not working. Why isn't it working? Because your insides want something that is not congruent with what God wants. Therefore, whoever wishes to be friends of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is the description of the world. It's the description of the world system. This is what, this is what doing business in the world is like. You want to get ahead, and so you'll do anything. You'll step on the heads of people in order to get ahead. You want something, and so it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. That's the way the world does things. It's not the way the kingdom does. I want to remind you that this is also concerning prayer. Because remember, you prayed towards the temple. This is going to be important for the context that we're talking about. This is about your prayer life. You prayed towards the temple, and then God released all these blessings. You got provision. You got healed. Disease got rebuked. You began to become victorious. James is saying, why aren't your prayers that should be working not working? Well, they're not working because you're doing it with a motive, an interior motive, that isn't in the kingdom. You want something, and you're not willing to settle, and you're mad at other people because they won't give you what you want. Stupid pastor, standing in the way of my dream. What did I do? <laughs> Verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose when he says, he jealously desires the spirit which dwells in you. Remember, we're talking about you being the temple. Your prayer life should be working, but it's not working. Why? Because it's disconnected from what God wants. He jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in us. He gives us greater grace. And therefore it says God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Do you remember, it's Second Chronicles, the verse is, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll forgive them of their wicked ways, I'll heal their land, I'll release divine provision. This is what James is linking to. He's saying, the Spirit of God dwells in you, you are the temple, and God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable. Mourn and weep. 
Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he'll exalt you. This is for the purpose of those who are like, I don't know why my prayer life's not working. At the same time, you are like stepping on the head of your employees and you're willing to do anything to get ahead in life and you're destroying people. They don't work together, do they? Maybe that doesn't necessarily fit your situation. Verse 11, let's keep going. Don't speak against one another, brethren. For he who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but are a judge of it. Therefore, excuse me, there is only one lawgiver and one judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? As soon as you and I begin to play devil's advocate and decide one thing applies to us and the other one doesn't, we step out of the role of just submitting to God and being the temple and being a priest, and we start to move into the role of I get to decide to be God and decide what applies to me and what doesn't apply to me. And... We, we begin this process of invalidating the very promises that God has for us. And how does that manifest? It's when you start to speak against people. You notice that someone is not doing something that they should do, and so you begin to talk about it. And so you're standing as a judge over their life, not realizing that as soon as you entered into that judgment mindset, it actually just proved that you're not doing it too. Isn't that a good word? Okay, here we go. Verse 13. I love this section here. Woo! This is fire. You ready? Come now. Verse 13. You who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city. And we'll spend a year there and we'll engage in business and we'll make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, there's a little bit to unpack here, but I just want you to, just context. I'm just reading one verse after the other. Those don't really feel like they fit together, but they do. This is like, hey, your prayer life isn't working. Stuff's not coming the way you thought it would. Turns out it's because you have a motive that's really selfish. And you're willing to do anything to get your selfish motive at, like, answered. You're willing to step on people and speak badly about people in order to get your way. Right? You need to humble yourself so that God will heal you and restore you. He's talking to believers. And then he goes and he goes, listen, one of the signs that you're thinking like this, and you might be saying to yourself, Pastor Jamie, none of this stuff fits me. Ah, have you ever thought about life like this? Like, hey, what if we just, you know, packed up, put our life in an RV and just left? And we just went and did this for a year and we'll do business over there and and do business over here, and, when those, and then we'll just come back to our life like nothing changed and nothing happened and no accountability, and it doesn't really matter because it, we're not connected to anybody or responsible to anybody else, just ourselves. Or how about this? I, I'm sorry, I'm poking you in that this morning, but how about this? How about the retirement age? You've saved your whole life, and now it's time for you to be selfish. You get yours now. I've put away nickels after nickels after nickels until I get to this ripe old age of whatever it is now. The needle keeps moving, right? 64 and a half, 65 and a half, 67 and a half. I don't know. What are we at now? Like 92 or something you can retire? Social Security is available for those who reach 120. Okay, great. (laughs) 
But what if the attitude in your heart is simply this, that I am doing my work now so that I can do what I want later. And the writer is pointing to that and saying, at the root of that is something you're needing to recognize as sinister. As sinister. Not the choice. Retire, please, retire. Live an amazing life, but don't do it out of selfishness. Do it with intention. This says... You're boasting in a type of arrogance that is considered evil. That word evil, oh, man, is it up there? Yeah, okay, that word evil, that one right there. Go, ooh, that one's a bad one, okay? As it is, you're boasting, all such boasting is evil. That word is the active definition for the devil. That, that is, you are acting like Lucifer. Ouch! That one right there, that is, that's this. This is the active form of evil. It's not a passive form of evil. It's not like, oh, well, just maybe it's not right or not. No, this one is you are acting in character that is the very foundation of malignancy, of an evil being. You are acting demonically. What's demonic about this? It's that there's no fear of the Lord in it. There's no fear of the Lord in it. The fear of the Lord is that you know that you're accountable for your life. The fear of the Lord is that you know at the end of your days you're going to stand before a judge and he is going to open the books and you're going to realize you're accountable. Accountable for your life. Accountable for your resources. Accountable for every careless word. That your life was supposed to mean something and not only that, you were purchased by the blood of Jesus. And when he purchased you, there was a role. There was an office that you were supposed to maintain. It's called being a priest. There's a function. And that function is necessary for the rest of the world to get saved. You and I must act as the priests of God. I'm reminding you of some things today that we should have never left our brains. When you don't have a connection to eternity and you don't recognize that God is ruling over your life, you don't realize how fragile life is, you don't have responsibility or care for others, you are not thinking about the responsibility of stewardship, you're just living for yourself. And at the core of that is literally the motivation of the devil. It's Luciferian. I just thought I'd, I just, I just thought I'd just go get mine, except for you were bought with a price, and your life no longer is yours. And, and your God loves you so much, and literally, if you would just ask him, he'll give you the things that you're asking for. Like, you're the temple, and your prayer life will work, and so you should bring it before him, not just choose selfishly to ignore his ways and just do your thing. These are the differences between living in the world or living in the kingdom. You belong to your creator. And you and I are called to live in connectedness in that way. Can I get an amen up in here? Amen. Chapter 5. Here we go. Woo! It's getting hot in here. Come now. You rich, your people are, you're rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches are rotting, your garments have been moth-eaten, your gold and your silver have rusted. Their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. In it, for it is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold the pay of the laborers who mowed, mowed your fields, which have been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. 
you have lived luxuriously on the earth and you have led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man and he did not resist you. Oh man. Context. This book is written roughly between 64 and 68 AD. Between four and two, two and four years before Jerusalem would be destroyed. Two to four years before the worship system would completely come undone and the economy of Israel is gone. What this is speaking to is people who decided to get rich in the last days before the judgment of the Lord was going to come on Jerusalem. For the day of the Lord came. People have gotten rich choosing to not pay people, choosing to withhold. Why? Because they could get away with it under the Roman system. They were partnering with the Roman economy in order to get theirs, and they didn't care who they were destroying in the meantime. That's a Christian businessman choosing to do business like the world in a cutthroat way. That thing reminds me of what like, the Nazis were doing. That, that in the day of destruction, people were getting rich off of what was being stolen. They were, they were in the day where it should have been a judgment-worthy act. They saw a little way to make a bunch of money in that moment. That's like war profiteering. These kinds of markets are not meant for believers. These kinds of things are not meant for you to dabble in. Don't. Come now. You got rich by acting like the devil. That's what James is saying. Verse 7. People of God, be patient until the coming of the Lord. Why? Because the Lord's about to deal with all of it. Be patient. Verse 12. Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by what with any other oath but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Again, context. It's all about the temple. Think about it. Your prayer life doesn't work. Why? Because you're not acting as the holy temple. You're acting in a defiled way. So your temple is defiled and you're acting according to the world, even though you're supposed to be a priest. So your prayer life's not working. You made a whole bunch of money and you're needing mercy. The judgment of the Lord is coming. People begin to use things like the temple to swear upon so that they could create an oath. And the writer says this, don't swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no so that you don't fall under judgment. Let me put that a different way. Don't tie yourself to any earthly structure that's temporary because you are made for eternal things. I don't have time to get into all of it, but Jesus reiterates that in Matthew 5 as well. Verse 13, here we go. This is where we're, we're going to land and camp on, and you're going to see how this whole thing comes together. James 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you'll be healed. For the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. For it was Elijah, who was a man just like ours, with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years, six months. And then he prayed again, and the sky poured forth rain. Okay. <laughs> oh, Jesus, help. Okay. You're a believer. You're the temple of God. The blessings of the Lord are these. 
that you would be victorious, that you would not get sick, that if you got sick, you get healed, that if you had been overcome by anything, that you would become the overcomer, that if you had a lack of provision, that provision would be released. If there was disease or sickness, that it would be rebuked, you would be delivered. If you had a loss of inheritance, that inheritance would come back to you. You know the blessings, right? All this stuff is supposed to happen. James says this. You're a believer acting according to the things of the world, but you're called to be a holy priest who represents the temple of God. And if you're a believer who is not seeing the results of the kingdom in your life and not seeing the results of the temple, if you are suffering, torment, if you got some torment going on in your life, you should pray. Why should you pray? Because as soon as you begin to pray, what begins to happen? The blessing of the temple, who you are, begins to be enacted and torment gets removed from your life. Yeah? If you're cheerful, you should sing praises. Why? Because that's where victory comes from. Is there anyone among you who is sick? He should call for the elders of the church that they would pray over him that they would anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. And that's why you should confess it. Because when you pray, you get forgiven, and mercy gets released. And if you are sick, when you come into the presence of the Lord, when you're praying, what happens? You get healed. What happens if a person who is a believer is doing those things but it's not working. You should call the elders of the church who are the functioning authority of a, a living temple. They're like pillars in the living temple. See, you are a living stone. You're being formed into a house of God. In our community, the elders are representing that authority structure. And why would they lay hands on you? Why would they anoint you with oil? Because when we lay hands on somebody, we're restoring them unto what? Unto them being the temple. We're extending the covering of the name of the Lord over them. We should anoint them with oil. When you anoint someone with oil, you're setting them apart for that ministry. Do you know what this is? This is not the protocol for healing ministry. This is the protocol for restoring a defiled temple. This is restoring a defiled temple. This is, if you got these things going on, the blessing of the Lord is supposed to cause all this life to flow up and in through you. And so if you don't have that stuff going on, start to confess and receive mercy. Call the elders of the church around you and have them lay hands on you and restore the thing that got defiled by the enemy. You're the only one talking to me, Tad, so I, I can't tell if other people are thinking right now or when, Tad, when we, <laughs> when we then lay hands on somebody, right, and we declare that the name of the Lord over them, we're restoring them back as a living stone in the temple system, the house of God, and then what the reality is, is that if there was a defiled conscience, they'll be forgiven and released mercy, and their hearts will be restored, and in belief, the presence of the Holy Spirit should fill them again. If they're feeling distance, they should humble themselves. And if they'll do that, then all the blessings of the Lord will come back upon their life. Does that make sense, Tad? It's incredible, right? And so, like, if you and I were sitting down with somebody, and they were struggling... Right? And, but I could see, like, from their life, we're talking about it, and it turns out they're, just, they're living like the world. We could call them back into the lifestyle of, like, hey, you should live like a holy priest. And, oh, by the way, whatever's got you stuck, let's lay hands on you. Let's get you unstuck. Release that unction back over their life. Restore them in that. And then the blessing of the Lord should flow again. Isn't that amazing? And if you haven't been baptized into Jesus' name, you should be. Why? Because the name of the Lord needs to be assigned to your life. <laughs> if you've never received the Holy Spirit, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit hasn't come on your life, you should go for that. Why? Because it's, it is the representation that you have become the temple. There should be evidence of that. 
These are things that are available to all of us. And if you found yourself as a believer who one time in your life was on fire, but now you find yourself like your heart hardened and you're not on fire for Jesus anymore, what should you do? You should repent. You should turn your life back over. You should submit, therefore, to God and humble yourself before him so that you would be restored and reconciled back into the body of Christ, that life would be restored to you. You and I are a holy priesthood, and our job is to do that for the world, not just for one another. Elijah was a man just like us. Are you ready for this? He was a man just like us with our nature. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain. And then he prayed again, and it rained. Elijah was enforcing the temple worship system. Second Chronicles 6, 26. God said this, or excuse me, Solomon prayed, Lord, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain, because we've sinned against you. Let them pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin and then hear from heaven, forgive their sins and send rain on your land, which you've given to your people as an inheritance. And God replies to Solomon, 2 Chronicles 7, 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's palace, he successfully completed all that he had planned on doing. And then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and he said, I have heard your prayer, have chosen this place for myself. If I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years and six months. He then prayed again, and the sky poured forth rain on the earth and produced its fruit. My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth... And one turns him back. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Because each one of us represent people that we have not seen yet. Your life will extend the temple over lives that have not come to know Jesus yet. You are a priest and the ministry of your life is going to touch so many more people to the end of your life. If someone strays from the truth, call them back and restore them. Lay hands on them. Declare them that temple again, holy, set apart. Anoint them with oil. Let them get healed. Let them get forgiven. And watch as God brings that same ministry through them to the world. Is anybody alive this morning? Let's take our job as being priests seriously. Look around the room just real quick. Just look down the aisle. There's people that, you got some seats in between you, right? Now look up here real quick. You saw that empty seat? Look up here real quick. Who's supposed to be sitting there? I, I'm not, this isn't a guilt trip. And this isn't an invite your neighbor sermon. That's not this. This is, there are people in your life who have fallen away from the Lord and they feel distant from God. And that distance <clears throat> That distance can be removed if you'll go lay hands on them and love them. If you'll go release mercy to them. If you'll go talk to them. If you'll appeal to them and help them to see that God's blessing wants to land on their life, all they need to do is humble themselves and receive. You and I have a calling to restore family members. You and I have a calling. There are people who got bitter in the last season. Man, political season was not easy on people. The COVID season, not easy on people. People got bitter. People got estranged from the church. There's all sorts of stuff, messy stuff that's been happening in the last years of ministry in America. You have friends that have become casualties. Don't let them become casualties. Go love them. Go find a way to lay hands on them and restore them. 
Don't let people just drift from this kingdom. Just stand to your feet today. Thanks. You guys did good. That was laborious. Heavy. Oh, but so needed. You're a royal priesthood. I met this guy. I was living in Germany, and uh, he, uh, he was a friend. He, he worked in one of the shops that was near my shop. And we went out one night for dinner, and he was hanging out with us and came over to Nicole and I's house afterwards. And it was getting later in the night, and, and I was talking to him just about Jesus. You throw that music on, that would be great there. I was talking to him about Jesus and just how, like, his life could be receive mercy. And he just began to weep. And he's like, no, you don't understand, Jamie. He's like, you don't know what I've done. Like, he left his wife and his kids. He made some really bad decisions. And he's got all this guilt piled on him. He's like, you don't know what I've done. I'm saying, no, man, Jesus will restore you. The stuff that's been lost and that got destroyed, like, that's not forever gone. The Lord can touch that stuff and heal. There may be consequences for choices, but it doesn't mean that it's gone forever. There's an inheritance there that's yours, but you gotta humble yourself and receive mercy. You gotta be willing to forgive yourself. Let that forgiveness flow. He stood in the, the driveway of my house and, and he's yelling back and forth with me because he just cannot believe. He's like, no, God will never forgive me. And he's bawling and he's, he is hell bent on refusing to let God's mercy touch his life. And you can see that he's just overwhelmed. There's a God moment at hand and God's trying to touch his life, but he is chosen in his pride to refuse to receive it. Don't do that. Man, when the Lord touches your heart and he pulls up near, just soften your heart and receive. I know that you've done dumb things. All of us have. But if you just believe that Jesus' blood is enough, it really is. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. He'll restore you. He'll set your life on a right path. It doesn't have to be the end. This could be a brand new day. Would you put a hand on your own heart this morning? Jesus, in this place today, Lord, we extend hands upon ourselves this morning and we proclaim mercy. I just want you to declare mercy over your own soul. I declare that Jesus is mercy over my own soul. Lord, declare mercy over each one, that they would be forgiven, that you would touch them, that you'd restore them. God, where that heart has been hardened against you and they've been refusing to hear, refusing to listen, so convinced that they've done too much, they've gone too far, oh, Jesus, that you would touch their hearts today and restore them. Just restore them, Jesus. Just restore them. I want every voice in the room today, would you pray this with me? I'm going to pray this prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. But man, if your heart is in agreement, God will touch and move in your life. It goes like this. Just pray along with me right now, okay? Repeat after me. Father in heaven, come on, every voice, every person, just pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus that he died on the cross in my place. And I did not deserve it. And I have not earned it. But I choose to receive mercy today. I receive your gift of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. Forgive me, Father. Restore me. Restore the calling that I might walk in your purposes and fulfill who you called me to be. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Lord, bless your people. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his countenance be upon you. May you experience his graciousness his favor, and his peace. And everybody who dared to agree with that said, amen. Amen, amen. Come on, can we give a good clap to the Lord this morning?